Welcome to the BBB National Programs podcast, Better Series, where we will explore top of mind topics and self regulation with business and industry leaders. Together, we seek to understand the leading trends and innovations that continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. Welcome to the BBB National Programs Better Series podcast. As we're recording today's podcast, the U.S. is entering the fourth month of a socially distanced reality, with cities just now across the country beginning to cautiously reopen. While everyone seeks a return to some level of normal, one of COVID-19's casualties is, according to the Federal Reserve, the job market, with unemployment rates hitting their highest levels since the Great Depression. Although the outlook has improved since a peak in April, experts still warn that we're by no means out of the woods, with the Fed saying higher than normal unemployment rates could linger for up to two years. Millions of unemployed Americans are searching for solutions, and many are turning to direct selling for answers. Direct selling companies, which include any company which markets its product or services directly to consumers through an independent sales force, brought in $35.4 billion in sales in 2018. While there's much to be gained from participating in this booming part of the industry, there are also inherent complexities, including the decentralized nature of these companies. With large numbers of individuals acting independently to sell a product or service, the risk of bad actors taking advantage of consumers is high. In recognition of these challenges, along with a desire among industry leaders to improve standards through self-regulation, The BBB National Programs created the Direct Selling Self-Regulatory Council, or DSSRC. It's an independent body that provides impartial monitoring, enforcement, and dispute resolution when direct selling companies or their sales forces are accused of making false product claims or income representations across digital platforms. Peter Marinello and Howard Smith are attorneys in the DSSRC, and they join us today to talk about how to navigate the gray areas of the direct selling space. Peter and Howard, thanks for joining us. Hello, James, and thanks for having us this morning. Well, let's just to to level set for everyone. What are we talking about when we say direct selling and and who is the typical direct seller if if there is the typical person? So, Peter, I'll start with you. You know, really interesting question. Um, You know, direct selling is really this blanket term that encompasses a variety of business forms, really premised, though, on person-to-person selling in locations other than brick-and-mortar and and retail establishment, um, such as media, social media platforms, or uh, the home of of a salesperson or prospective uh, customer. You know, kind of think the, the old Electrolux model, where it was the vacuum cleaner guy who went, um, you know, house to house and made that direct in-person sale outside again of any kind of retail uh, environment. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the um, direct sales occur at home. They occur at work and online, and again in other non-store locations. And the interesting thing I think about direct selling and direct sellers as it really eliminates several of the of the middlemen involved in in traditional product distribution right such as i don't know the regional distribution center and the wholesaler so instead products go from the manufacturer to the direct sales company then to the distributor or representative and then to the consumer um, the products sold through direct sales are not typically again found in your walmarts and typical retail locations which really means finding a distributor or sales rep is going to be the only uh, method to buy these products or services. Um, I just wanted to add one other thing, James, too. There are really different types of direct selling. You know, I mentioned the Electrolux kind of salesman, the door-to-door guy. That's really single-level direct sales. Um, You know, that type of direct selling is done on a one-to-one basis. in-person presentations, you know, again, door to door, you know, direct selling can be done through online, through catalogs as well. Um, generally, it's income earned two ways, right? Through sales and commissions and possible bonuses. Um, then there's another piece, it's multi-level marketing. That's kind of a different type of direct selling business model. Now, sales in multi-level marketing are made in a variety of ways, including 
again, single or party planning type presentations, but it's also done through online stores and catalogs. And the income earned through uh, MLM, which is the acronym for multi-level marketing, is commission on sales and the sales made by other partners, right, that you recruit as distributors into the company. Um, again, those, you know, network marketing is another term used, but MLM and network marketing, James, um, they aren't interchangeable terms. Well, L L MLMs and network marketing are forms of direct sales. As I mentioned, not all direct sales involve MLMs. So um, it's, it's really this kind of nebulous definition of direct selling, but it's a very nuanced business model, and it's been very effective over the years, yeah. So, uh, Howard, how does the DSSRC work within this, what sounds like a very complex space? So how does, how does self-regulation work in this market, and how is that different than what the, the, the government agencies do at the FTC and the FDA and others? Sure, and, and you're right to observe that it is a very complex space and, and absolutely something that we've learned as we've rolled this program out. Um, you know, I'd say the, the primary regulator of direct selling is the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, more specifically, their division of marketing practices versus, let's say, their division of ad practices, which tends to focus on, you know, the 30-second TV spots you see when you're watching an NFL game. Uh, the FDA does have a role. They can focus on issues such as product labeling. Uh, they do have jurisdiction over certain types of direct sellers, uh, namely those that say market uh, dietary supplements. Um, you know, and this, I'm going to take a step back. So, you know, the FTC's role in regulating direct selling uh, in no small part led to the creation of this program administered by BBB National Programs. Uh, the industry turned to self-regulation in, in, in response to some several high-profile enforcement actions that were brought over the last several years against direct sellers and really high-level regulators, including former acting chairs at the Federal Trade Commission, spoke directly to the industry and said, hey, it is time for this industry to turn to and create a meaningful, effective, and independent self-regulation program. And so while we're talking, a lot of this conversation is sort of, you know, direct selling in the age of the pandemic. Uh, to take a step, step back, you know, this program actually launched in January of last year. So we, we had been had a full, you know, year and a couple months under our belt before this pandemic uh, came into being. But your question as to how we differ from the regulators, uh, you know, we, we analyze, review, and make recommendations on how companies and their sales forces should disseminate their product claims and their income claims. And we make recommendations, we write up decisions, we don't have the power of the federal regulators. We can't sanction anyone, fine anyone. What we can do is say, you should either discontinue these claims, you should modify these claims. We make recommendations and companies can choose to comply or not comply. We get a very high compliance rate. Uh, that's in part because of the history of BBB national programs, self-regulation uh, programs that go back you know, 40 years. Uh, and the relationship that, that we have with our self-regulation programs with the regulators. So when we do make a recommendation, if a company says, I'm not going to listen to you and ignore you, we then refer it to law enforcement, most often the Federal Trade Commission. And they have indicated that when we make a referral to them, they sort of put that at the top of their enforcement pile. Um, I just wanted to, if it's okay, you know, and Howard, that was a really good explanation about um, distinguishing self-regulation you know, from um, from federal law enforcement, really. Um, you know, the, the one thing I just wanted to add was I've always viewed self-regulation as a really good complement to what, um, you know, to what the federal agencies are doing. Um, you know, we're all working in a world of limited resources. And I think a good self-regulation model allows the government to, um, to really implement their resources to go after the real nefarious and egregious uh, perpetrators out there. And self-regulation can pick off some of the low-hanging fruit and allow the government to pursue, again, some of the more serious uh, offenders out there. And, and that's a great point because you, you can't you can't police everyone. That's just not, not, not practical in an industry as complex as this or any industry, frankly. Uh, Peter, while you have the floor here, let me, let me go ahead and, and start shifting our conversation a little bit into this current environment. Um, but I want to reference something that Howard just said, which was this program's a little over a year old now, almost a year and a half old. So you've clearly learned some things 
in that time. So can you contrast how the this world was working pre-COVID-19 and now how it is working? And what has been the Im- impact on these direct selling companies and the direct sellers? Yeah. Yeah. James, you know, it's interesting because as Howard mentioned, we launched this program in January of 2019. And one of the things I think Howard and I learned in administering the program is that the companies, the direct selling companies and their sales forces had this real appetite for more instruction, more education, more guidance regarding the rules of the road with respect to claim substantiation. And, you know, the coronavirus epidemic and the crisis really brought to light several several things. Here's what we do know. Let's start with this. We do know the CDC, uh, that's Center of Disease Controls and Prevention, the World Health Organization, Food Drug Administration, they've all gone out and, on the record and said, hey, right now there are no approved vaccines, drugs, investigational products available to treat or prevent COVID-19. Um, you know, we've seen the FTC be very vigilant and, um, and really kind of sound the alarm regarding some of the claims that are being, you know, disseminated in the marketplace. And then their vig- vigilance really has been warranted. It has, because, um, you know, we saw the claims that they pursued regarding, you know, commingling um, the epidemic and the business opportunity, you know, to the, to the you know, to the current environment, really. Um, you know, they sent out several rounds of warning letters. I think, the, you know, the first round went out, you know, in early April, uh, and, you know, they sent another group of warning letters out just this past Friday. Um, and specifically, you know, I, I think they looked at six direct sellers in particular uh, on Friday regarding some of the claims that were being disseminated out there. And I, I have to say, you know, DSSRC, from where we're sitting, we agreed with the FTC actions, you know, um, with this current environment, you know, the direct selling opportunity is a really compelling one, I think, for a lot of consumers out there. But um, with that opportunity comes responsibility, right? Um, and the responsibility is to make sure you're not over embellishing the opportunity and to make sure um, that all claims are de- being disseminated truthfully and accurately. Um, Howard, against that backdrop, um, are you seeing through the DSSRC, uh, are you seeing more activity in this area around COVID-19 or are people playing it pretty straight? Oh, so I'm going to make a distinction between people and companies. Um, you know, as Peter mentioned, uh, you know, the FTC and the FDA they have issued these warning letters. They've been very active on, on the COVID-19 claims. You know, we've done a number of things on that as well. We posted a statement on our website urging direct selling companies to be particularly mindful of any claims that might relate to the pandemic, really you know, avoid express or implied claims that your product treats or alleviates symptoms of, of the disease or uh, can cure or alleviate symptoms of viruses, even, even boost or uh, um, you know, improve your immune function type claims. Uh, but in our casework, uh, since the onset of this pandemic, we've actually opened about 25 inquiries into marketing claims that we've seen that relate to the pandemic. Uh, these are almost always are an overzealous or you know rogue Salesforce member. Uh, the companies themselves have been pretty proactive, putting out public statements that hey, we're not saying our our product has anything to do with uh, you know improving or treating uh, COVID-19. Uh, the, the 25 inquiries I mentioned, I'll give you some examples because you, you see things like um, the best defense against this or any virus is product X, something like that. Uh, so we saw one where someone said, I use, it was a, it was a dietary supplement. I use the supplement to keep COVID-19 out of this house, that type of thing. And it's not just the product claims. We also see income claims that can be tied to the pandemic. So you'll see something like someone says, uh, are you one of the millions of people out of work? Uh, Join my team and replace your income. Those types of claims. Um, So we've definitely seen an uptick. We've been very active in opening these inquiries. I said about 25 in the last several months. Uh, We've been, uh, we had a very high success rate in getting these claims taken out of circulation and quite quickly. Uh, We would reach out to the company. The company 
more often than not, either had already heard about it and was trying to reach out to the Salesforce member and say, hey, take down that Facebook post. Or if they hadn't heard about it, they thanked us for bringing it to their attention. And, and in some cases, we've had these claims taken down really within 24 hours. Uh, so we've had success with the claims that we have uh, identified, but we have definitely seen an uptick in them. I, I, I wouldn't call it pervasive or systemic, and it's certainly not from our observation coming from a, a company level. It's, it's a Salesforce member out making you know, a, a, an overzealous or overaggressive claim. Peter, every part of the economy has been touched by this. And, you know, you know, we just had the, Howard just made the reference to people saying, join my team and replace your income. So people are looking now for new opportunities. Um, but a lot of industries are making changes. They're, they're seeing that their business model um, needs to be adjusted in a post-pandemic world, and they're already starting to make those adjustments. Are you seeing that in the direct selling world? I think we are, James. You know, um, you know, it's interesting because the ramifications of the coronavirus, they're not mutually exclusive in any way to the to the direct selling industry. It's really it's really touched all companies and businesses, right, in all sectors in the way that they're uh, they're messaging to their respective audiences. Um, you know, and how how we got into this a little bit. The direct selling channel, it's always been a really unique one here. Um, I, I think the strength of the business model is really providing individuals with this opportunity to earn supplemental income. It's such a key word, it's supplemental income. It's not about replacing income or quitting your job and, and doing things like that. And, um, you know, as Howard touched on, I do think the challenge for direct selling companies is, is properly framing that opportunity in a way that doesn't embellish or exaggerate the opportunity. As Howard mentioned, you know, that overzealous, uh, that overzealous promise or claim um, you know, direct selling's never been about replacing income or making absorbent amounts of money. That's not what it's about. Um, it does provide a real legitimate vehicle, though, for people who want to maybe put a few extra dollars in their pocket and provide some valuable products and services to a particular group of consumers. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence either, James, that uh, the industry's done fairly well during the first and second quarters of, of 2012, of 2020, you know, relatively speaking, of course, um, you know, and I think there's a reason for that. I think over the past several years, you know, direct sellers have really availed themselves of social media tools and platforms like, you know, uh, Facebook chats and Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the business model does allow for this real open and ongoing dialogue with communities as well as one-on-one -on -one interaction, you know, with consumers who want their products or services. Um, yeah, I think though, kind of looking, uh, looking at some of the consequences of, of what the coronavirus has meant to direct sellers, yeah, they've had to refine their messages and the way that they are communicating with their audiences. Um, but the direct selling community, they were kind of on that path probably uh, the last uh, three or four years anyway. So uh, while there has been a period of slight adjustment, um, I don't think it's impacted the direct selling channel like it has uh, some of the other sectors of advertising. Well, Howard, I'm going to give you the, the shot, first shot at the, at the wrap up question, which is kind of the, kind of the softball. And that is, you know, what really are the best practices uh, that have emerged and where do you think those best practices um, will take us now in a, in a, in a post pandemic world. Sure. Uh, so a few things, best practices, you know, you and Peter both touched on one of the unique challenges in this space is having a sales force with you know, tens of thousands, some, in some cases, millions of independent distributors, right? This is not uh, Procter and Gamble where every marketing claim that goes out into the marketplace is going to be vetted by, you know, 20 lawyers. Uh, it's, it's a unique challenge when anyone with a cell phone and an Instagram account is writing their own copy and putting uh, claims into the marketplace. So challenge one is monitoring your field. And luckily there are these uh, vendors that, that use technology that is more complicated than I can explain, but to go out there and sort of scour the web, 
find these potentially problematic claims and get them taken down when they inevitably uh, are put out there. Uh, on the product side, uh, you know, it's really about overpromising on product efficacy. You know, obviously the COVID ones are easy, right? The CDC has told us there's no such product that cures or treats this disease, so you just can't make them. But even, even outside of the pandemic, you know, uh, you have companies, Salesforce members making health related claims, for example, that a, um, a dietary supplement boosts immune function, those types of claims. And when you're making health related claims, the evidentiary bar is very high. It is a competent and scientific evidence, competent and reliable scientific evidence. And I'm not going to bore you with the legal definition of what that means, but it's a very heightened evidentiary standard. It basically means a good, well-designed clinical study carried out by people in the relevant area using methods that will generally uh, are generally accepted to produce reliable results. Um, so avoiding over-promising on your product claims. You know, we have seen things like a dietary supplement claiming, hey, this treats MS or PTSD or epilepsy. Those are very aggressive type claims and more often than not, uh, they're going to be misleading to consumers. Uh, on the income side, as Pete mentioned, it's really about avoiding overpromising. Uh, the message should be a modest supplemental opportunity to earn income. There are other um, facets of the direct selling opportunity that are positives and should be stressed. It's the idea that hey, you have flexibility in your time. You know, maybe you're maybe especially now you're educating your kids at home. You're you're the second or third grade teacher, so you know working nine to five doesn't work. You can make your own hours. You can work from anywhere. Uh, those types of claims. The over promising, the saying, hey, uh, join my team and make a thousand dollars a week. Those types of claims. If the average sales rep is making $75 a week and you're saying, hey, join my team and make a thousand, that's likely going to be misleading to consumers. And, and I'll just note that one of the trickier scenarios that we've seen over and over again is the testimonial. It's the person who actually makes the thousand dollars a week or the two thousand dollars a week. And they say, this is my story. I, I, you know, I'm telling people, hey, look, I did this. It's true. I can show you. And you know, that still, that message, and there's been consumer perception studies on this, the general consumer sees that, and what they hear is, that could be me. And if it's not, if so, if, take for example, I'm, I'm doing a video and I say, hey, join my team, make $2,000 a week, and, and that's true for me. If you don't have some sort of a very clear and conspicuous disclosure that says, hey, my results are not typical, and here's what is, you know, that the typical participant earns $100 a week, that's going to be a problem. So, you know, I do think as we've rolled this program out over the last year and a half, um, I think some folks that didn't realize that those sort of truthful testimonials were a problem now understand it, and, and they seem to be moving towards improving really the, what are material and necessary disclosures. Pete, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually want to elaborate, Howard, on something you touched on. And James, here's one of the great things with about working with with somebody an expert like Howard is too, because um, he's this great think tank for me personally to kind of bounce things off of and to get a really better understanding about how things work in the direct selling channel. So you know, Howard touched on this really important point about the size of the sales forces that direct direct selling companies have, and as he mentions, I mean, we're talking about sales teams of hundreds of thousands. Of, uh, of individuals. And here's where the challenge is too. With, with Salesforce teams of that size, you know, trying to implement company compliance becomes this real challenge. Um, you know, I had mentioned earlier on that, um, that one of the things we found is, you know, uh, compliance teams and Salesforce members have this real appetite for more instruction, for more guidance. Um, and I do think this compliance challenge is going to necessitate this uh, this this need of ongoing reinforcement of what can and can't be said about companies, products, and their services to make sure, for example, and Howard touched on it, that they're always disclosing material information for consumers and doing it clearly and conspicuously. I can't overemphasize that point. Uh, I do think the days of the one-person compliance team 
those days are over. I think companies really, really kind of need teams of individuals focused solely on compliance. And it's not just education either. It's really having mechanisms in place for things like accountability to address recidivist behavior, right? Um, if that means fining, suspending, or terminating distributors, so be it. You know, um, it's implementing almost a zero tolerance uh, standard of behavior. Uh, I do think the trend right now is to look at outs- to look for outside monitoring vendors for assistance with compliance. And really, I know it's sometimes cost prohibitive, but it's a worthwhile investment. You know, engaging an independent monitoring company to scour the internet and social media for problematic claims, um, not only does it help, you know, in terms of overall enforcement, but it also helps force some great dialogue with compliance teams, with executive teams, um, you know, um, and, and the company sales force and having those lines of communication open. You know, DSSRC is trying to do its part with providing some more instruction. You know, we've met with company compliance teams and we've discussed all the hallmarks of good, robust claim substantiation, you know, different levels of evidentiary support, as Howard mentioned. Um, we also recently dress, drafted this nice earning claims guidance document for the industry to do a couple of things, um, really to provide, um, to, to provide again, just general guidance and direction regarding general rules of the road um, about the use of earning claims with an emphasis on presenting these claims in social media. It also helps identify issues you know, for the for the companies out there, um, providing them with a better understanding about how DSSRC evaluates these claims, these express claims, the implied claims as well. Um, as Howard mentioned, how we look at success stories and testimonials, how we evaluate, you know, bonus and incentive claims, things like that. Well, gentlemen, you have given us a lot to think about today, and you have certainly shown a spotlight on a segment of the economy that, frankly, I don't think many people understand or realize it has the, the market clout that it does. And, you know, bringing some order to the chaos is, is always going to be a welcome thing. Uh, if someone wants to learn more about the DSSRC and a lot of the issues you've raised here today, guys, I'm assuming uh, the place to go is the website, and that would be BBB National Programs website, which is bbbprograms.org. Peter, Howard, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate your time, James. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. And thank you for listening to the BBB National Programs Better Series. Don't miss an episode by subscribing on our website, bbbprograms.org. Click on the podcast tab and hit the subscribe button. You'll find all of our episodes right there where you can listen on iHeartRadio, your Apple Podcast app, or your favorite streaming platform. You just enjoyed the Better Series podcast. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blueberry.com. Follow us on Twitter at BBB underscore NTL programs. Send your comments and ideas to podcast at BBBNP.org. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB national programs or its affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.